Ta-da, 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 ta-da. Hello, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, all ages, all shapes, all sizes, all nationalities. It's me, your old pal, Mr. For Christopher. I'm here today to talk about stories. Why? Well, there's a few different inspirations for today's conversation. And one of them I want to share with you all, well, there's actually a few. There's a few different places and things that have led me to want to talk about stories. I I know we all have a relationship with stories. We grew up being read stories, soothed to sleep, hearing people's stories. But I think there is something even more deeply ingrained in us when it comes to listening to or telling stories. And I'm on a mission, ladies and gentlemen, boys and girls, because telling stories is an art form, from my point of view, that is being lost on many of us. These days, the capacity that we have to engage one another and exchange information by storytelling is no longer relevant in our lives. See, if you go back hundreds and even thousands of years, we would sit around a fire together at night. I'm talking like before electricity. So the only way we could heat our homes and have any light was by a fire or by a candle. And we weren't looking at devices to get entertainment. We weren't even watching a television. We were looking at the fire, mesmerized by it, and entertaining each other and engaging with each other with a story. And it became, as I say, this art form where we would weave together words and take people on a journey and entertain them in these magnificent landscapes that we illustrated for each other with this art of storytelling or even joke telling. And over time that evolved, we left the fire and technology came into our lives. And then we started sitting around a dining table and we would sit and probably just share our evening meal together and talk about our day, tell each other stories about what we saw, what we encountered, what made us upset, what made us laugh, what was what were the notable events of the day and we told one another and now the fire we sit around is technology where i'm reaching you today and we've lost this capacity or are losing it some of us more than others of the gift of the gab the capacity to engage one another in conversation now this isn't about preaching at you because i saw this meme going around and memes believe me are a big way that we are telling each other stories today but i saw this meme going around of the interior of a restaurant and on the wall they had painted this big sign that said no we don't have a wi-fi password talk to each other like you're meant to and there's something so preachy about that to me I don't dislike technology. I enjoy sharing memes and communicating on all these different technological platforms, but I also love stories and being able to paint pictures, as I say, for each other. I had an amazing conversation about this the other day with Dr. Gary, not doctor, Mr. Gary Douglas, the founder of Access Consciousness. And we were talking about um, how he wrote his book, that I have here, folks. I've got plenty of props today. This is Gary Douglas, one of Gary Douglas's many books, but this is his, his novel. Uh, and it is such a beautiful book, one of my absolute favorites. I've got a pile of, of books to talk to you about today because, you know, the theme is story time. So we have to put on our, our warm, comfy cardigan and make ourselves a delightful cup of tea and settle into the nurturing, relaxing experience of reading stories. I just have to strain my tea bag. I'm having peppermint today because, you know, just what I like. And Gary was talking to me about story writing. Um, 
And he was telling me about a book that I read many years ago called The Old Man and the Sea by Ernest Hemingway. Probably a lot of you are familiar with this book, The Old Man and the Sea. And he was saying how when Hemingway wrote it originally, it was 800 pages. And what he did was he wanted to create an elegant book and he trimmed it and cut it and trimmed it and cut it and edited it down from 800 pages until there were 120 some pages. That's a huge chop from what it was. And it wasn't because the 800 pages were bad. It was because it, he was aware that you could tell the same story with just as much impact and just as much energy without needing all of the words. There's this, the way I look at the definition, definition, definition of the word elegance is having the maximum impact you can possibly have with the least amount of effort. How much effort would it be to read 800 pages rather than 125? Which is partially how he wrote this book, The Place, and what he was describing to me in it, like I'm just gonna find out here, his book has 136 pages. It is such a great read. And he talks about how he described certain characters in this book. He talked about how one of them, who's one of, he's a central pivotal character and there's so much in him as, as, as a person, as a being, but he describes him in one paragraph and no more. And what he aimed to do there was give you everything you needed to know about that character with the energy of the words he chose and how he wove them together and nothing superfluous. And I find that so exciting. But one of the first books I want to share with you, one of my absolute favorites, is The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain. Now I have kind of a funny relationship with this book because when I was a kid, this, this idea of being told stories, sorry, I just need a little tea. Mm. This teacup is one of my favorites to use because of its size. And it is about 260 years old. Imagine the stories it could tell, the lips, it's come in contact with the conversations it's been present for. I find that quite exciting. But back to Mark Twain. So when I was a child, quite often, my mother and I and my brother and sister would go to um, my grandparents' house. And well, hello from Peru, Yazadel. Yes, we would go to my grandparents' house. And after dinner, my grandfather would tell us stories. And he would capture us in his stories, telling us all about the crazy things that occurred for him and, and the wild adventures he had in his youth. And I thought, wow, my grandfather was such an interesting man. And he was. He could tell a story and he could take you someplace with the way he told it, the rhythm of his voice and the words that he used and the picture that that painted, the excitement in his voice and how he would build tension as he told it and then allow it to release. So Mark Twain, I got a little older than when we would go to our grandparents for dinner and I read The Adventures of Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain and discovered that just about all of my grandfather's stories came from this book he stole them. <laughs> they weren't his stories after all. They were part of this fantastic book. Now, I don't think any less of my grandfather for doing that. I think he's genius. He introduced us to something and he introduced us to a capacity to tell a story just with how he was with words. So we've talked about Mark Twain, Gary Douglas's book, The Place. Do you want to hear a little bit of it? 
I'm going to give you a little reading of this book because I personally love being read to. Yeah, see, Ina Basur says that story makes her laugh each time she's heard it. And that's the thing. Sometimes you think your stories, oh, people have heard them before, they're repetitive, but it's actually a gift to people when you keep reading them, you keep telling your stories. We've got a comment here. Thank you for speaking about this. I wondered how storytelling can be utilized. When is story a contribution and when is it not? Has the meaning of story changed? Storytelling, conveying ideas, invitations to possibilities, thought provokers on life, storytelling, sharing where people are right or wrong. Yeah, exactly. Well, I don't know about the right or wrong part. I'm gonna probably not necessarily agree with that. There is a tradition of storytelling where you try to convey a moral message, but that's not what I'm interested in and not what I'm talking about. I see a potential with stories to show people a different possibility or get them to look at things that they didn't consider could be real. Like right now here in Brisbane, Australia, where I live, there is a gallery exhibition that is so inspiring to me. It is, a collection of European masterpieces from the Metropolitan Museum in New York. And they're showing them here in Brisbane, Australia. And it's it, it spans about six or 700 years, the different time periods that these paintings are from. They're from anywhere from the medieval period all the way up to the 20th century. And there's pictures by the greatest painters you've ever heard of, Rembrandt, Renoir, Monet, Degas, Turner, um, the list goes on and on. And each Caravaggio, oh my God, the Caravaggio is unbelievable. But what I loved about it, the experience, and like walking through a lot of galleries, is you see all of these painters, these artists showing you a point of view. They're telling you a story and showing you what they see that has changed the world by showing you their unique perspective and sharing their awareness, you get to see something totally different. And that's something that each of you have as well, or all of us here. Each of us has this path that we've walked through life where we've seen different things, we've had different experiences and come to different awarenesses that has informed and created this unique perspective or point of view. And through story, through creation, through art, we share that with the world and invite other people to have an enriched experience from it. Yes, Yi Le Lao says the second option seems to be what peep story has become. Yes, this teaching tool where we show you what's right and what's wrong. And I think there's another possibility. So I'm going to read you a little bit of Gary Douglas's The Place and maybe a few other books because I've got a few other interesting books to share with you here. So where will I start? I sit in the car. Have I mentioned that I left the top at home? The weather will dictate my rest as I sit. The silence begins to soothe my weary soul and my body in a way I have not experienced since last I came this way. I open the door and slide out of the car. In front of me is a lazy stream and sandy beach. I slide out of my clothes and walk slowly into the water. It is chilly even this late in the summer. The goose pimples tell me I am still alive. I walk towards the rock submerged a couple feet below the surface. As I sit, the cold water on my crotch makes me stumble and I fall into the water. I come up with the same joy my little boy does when he plays in the surf or the pool. I suddenly miss his smile, his kisses, and the, Daddy, I love you so much, that precedes hugs and requests for toys. I sit on the rock and tears stream down my face. 
as the silence and peace of the stream embrace me and my body with a sense of finally belonging somewhere, somehow, some way, the tension begins to dissipate and the tiny fish begin to nibble on the hairs of my body as though these will bring their next meal. For me, it is the sensation that I have shut off so that I don't have to feel the gnawing knowledge that I should be able to revel in the innate sensorial perversity that bodies enjoy. The tears that drop salt into this sweet stream that, like true life, meanders in the easiest and blessed way that none live in the clattering world of choiceless menu. That menu that has too many choices so that we can make no choices real and as life. Suddenly the stupidity of no choice gives way to the burst of laughter. It creates the awareness of the oneness that I too belong with nature and am part of the stream of life and that it and I are the same. I have always felt separate and alone. And finally, I know I belong and that the pain I have lived as greater than me is truly the insane stupidity of making that greater than me in order to truly believe I have no choice. Mm. Mm -hmm. Just a couple paragraphs of the way Gary Douglas created his book, The Place, to show us something, not to preach, but to share a possibility he's aware of for us to enjoy. And to me, that's what writing, great writing can be. Sort of like putting together a dish of food, you know, like how do the flavors, the textures combine to create this sensorial experience for us to enjoy and maybe even open our mind or open us up to a possibility we didn't necessarily know was real or possible. Now, should we read a little bit of Mark Twain's Adventures of Huckleberry Finn? Because I, I think it's kind of fun to see the difference, the difference that different languages spell out and the way we put them together. Sure, I'll read a little bit. I kept quiet with my ears cocked about 15 minutes, I reckon. I was floating along, of course, four or five mile an hour, but you don't ever think of that, no. You feel like you were laying dead still on the water. And if a little glimpse of a snag slips by, you don't think to yourself how fast you're going. But you catch your breath and think, my, how that snag's tearing along. If you think it ain't dismal and lonesome out in a fog that way by yourself in the night, you try it once, you'll see. Next, for about a half an hour, I whoops now and then. At last, I hears the answer a long ways off and tries to follow it, but I couldn't do it. And directly, I judged I had got into a nest of towheads. For I had little dim glimpses of them on both sides of me. Sometimes just a narrow channel between and some that I couldn't see. I know it was there because I'd hear the wash of the current against the old dead brush and trash that hung over the banks. Well, I weren't long losing the whoops down amongst the towheads, and I only tried to chase them a little while. Anyway, because it was worse than chasing a jack-o'-lantern. You never know what a sound dodge around so and swap places so quick and so much. I had to claw away from the bank pretty lively four or five times to keep from knocking the islands out of the river. So, and so I judged the raft must be butting into the bank every now and then, or else it would get further ahead and clear out of hearing. It was floating a little faster than what I was. Well, I seemed to be in the open river again by and by, but I couldn't hear no sign of a whoop nowheres. I reckon Jim had fetched up a snag, maybe, and it was all up with him. I was good and tired, so I laid down in the canoe and said I wouldn't bother no more. 
I didn't want to go to sleep, of course, but I was so sleepy, I couldn't help it. So I thought I would just take one little cat nap. But I reckon it was more than a cat nap. For when I waked up, the stars were shining bright, the fog was all gone, and I was spinning down a big bend stern first. First, I didn't know where I was. I thought I was dreaming. And when things begun to come back to me, they seemed to come up dim out of last week. It was a momentous big river here with the tallest and the thickest kind of timber on both banks, just a solid wall, as well as I could see by the stars. I looked away downstream and seen a black speck on the water. I took out after it, but when I got to it, it weren't nothing but a couple of saw logs made fast together. Then I see another speck and chase that, then another, and in this time I was right. It was the raft. Notice how different it is, how different the rhythm and the color and the way the way he uses words to, to be a character. And it just, it feels like what we imagine the South to be. He takes us there with how he writes, not only from a kid's point of view, but from a kid with a certain level of education who has a certain level of grammar available to him. How much fun is that? How many of you out there think you can't write or, or aren't good storytellers? This is what I would like to change and like to invite people to. The capacity to use language eloquently in such a way that you only say what people can hear, because it's no good trying to rub, 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 shove anything down anyone's throats, but use language in such a way that you soften the edges of people and open them up to receiving a different possibility. Annalise is here. Thank you, Annalise. So I've got two other books that are quite different, but fun. Now, this is one of my absolute favorites. And I think this, the man who wrote this book, again, I think his story is so valuable because he lived in a time and he lived in a way that no one else was doing. And in so telling his story, he really changed the world. Um, his name was Quinton Crisp, and that's his picture. And he was, well, it says here on the back, Quinton Crisp has been described as one of England's works of art. In this funny moving account of his outrageous youth, he describes his unhappy childhood and the stresses of adolescence, which led him to London. This guy was became famous as a personality just for being who he was and being different but what's amazing about him is he was gay and willing to let people know and he was born in 1908 he was out living as a gay person and not trying to hide it as early as the 1920s or 30s it's just amazing So I want to read you a bit of his story because the way he is and the way he tells his story, again, shows you something so totally different. Someone's trying to contact me. So let's read a little bit of Quentin Crisp's story. And this book is called The Naked Civil Servant. Where shall I start? <laughs> Chapter two. Even in childhood, I was mad about men in uniform. 
as in a silent movie, when 30 long years had passed, I went back to the place of my birth to pose in the art school there. Passing through the railway station, I saw, with that inward eye that is the curse of solitude, my sister squatting by the ticket office to play with a baby bear that a sailor held on a lead. He stood for a while watching my sister and I watched him. I also remember the soldiers that were billeted in private houses in Sutton during the First World War. To most people, they represented a domestic inconvenience bravely borne, but to me, they were emotionally disturbing. When they marched away to Flanders, the girls lined the streets and with delicious sadness threw sweets to them. It all seemed wistful and romantic at the time. I had never then heard any of the things men say about women making fools of themselves. When the First World War was about half over, and people had given up saying that it would only last a few weeks and taken to prophesizing that it would go on forever. My father suffered his first defeat in the presence of the Joneses. He moved us all into a smaller house on the opposite side of the road. The only thing that worried me here was that I lost my captive audience. There were no rooms and presumably no money for servants who lived in. In the modern world, there were servants uh, in the modern world where servants are extinct, it is difficult to realize that to my parents, this change in their circumstances must have been rather like the fall. The only thing that made the situation bearable for them was that because it was wartime, all economies could be made to look like patriotic gestures. We moved into this new home when I was seven and out again when I was 10. And it is here that my definite childhood recollections began. Of the two houses that I had lived in previously, my memories are sharp, but have no chronology. Their background is hazy or even false, but if anyone were to utter the name of our wartime house, all the quality of my life there would come back to me. This house was almost the last in the road. My memory always looks towards the empty fields and the poplar trees standing along the mauve gray paths that zigzag slightly uphill towards Belmont and the school to which I then went. The sky is sunless, the earth unpopulated, and to my waking eyes, this landscape is forever in a state of pause without the least hint of expectancy. This is also the setting for my most persistent childhood dream, and in the nightmare, foreboding is everywhere. I look at each poplar tree in turn until I catch a glimpse of a figure hiding behind one of them, a woman in a black hat and a gray cloak. As soon as I see her, she starts to come towards me along the path. She travels at great speed, but her cloak gives no sign that her legs are moving. I do not cry out. I do not run away. The dream has no ending. Usually, <laughs> Quentin Crisp is a lot more dry and almost like Oscar Wilde in, in the way he gives these throwaway little remarks. <laughs> Let me read you again the first paragraph of this guy's book. I just think it's amazing. From the dawn of my history, I was so disfigured by the characteristics of a certain kind of homosexual person that when I grew up, I realized that I could not ignore my predicament. The way in which I chose to deal with it would now be called existentialist. Perhaps Jean-Paul Sartre would be kind enough to say that I exercised the last vestiges of my free will by swimming with the tide, but faster. In the time of which I am writing, I was merely thought of as brazening it out. I became not merely a self-confessed homosexual, but a self-evident one. That is to say, I put my case not only before the people who knew me, but before strangers as well. This was not difficult to do. I wore makeup at a time when even on women eyeshadow was sinful. Many a young girl in those days had to leave home and go on the streets simply in order to wear nail varnish. As soon as I put my uniform on, the rest of my life solidified round me like a plaster cast. From that moment on, my friends were anyone 
who could put up with the disgrace, my occupation, any job from which I was not given the sack, my clay playground, any cafe or restaurant from which I was not barred, or any street corner from which the police did not move me on. An additional restricting circumstance was that the year in which I first pointed my toes towards the outer world was 1931. This guy was doing things in 1931 that some people can't do today. The bravery that that takes, the willingness to be different that that takes is phenomenal. And then to write a book about it and publish it is also absolutely inspiring, if you ask me. You might not like his style. He has a certain <sighs> dismissive charm about him, but I particularly enjoy it. So I love stories. I think they're of value. And I would like to invite people to have more of this as a possibility. So for anyone out there who's keen and interested, I'm going to share with you, first of all, if you go here to my website, mrchristopherhughes.com under events, I have a number of different classes coming up and one of them is called How to Tell a Story. There's plenty of free things coming up. This is a paid class for one day or two, three hour sessions over two days. Online, we have a number of languages being translated and it's called How to Tell a Story. So. I'd love to invite you all, anyone who would like more ease with this. This is part of the uh, one of the specialty courses within Access Consciousness called Right Voice for You. And we're going to be looking at your voice in story and how to use words like a painter with a paintbrush to show people something different. So. Thank you all. I've had a wonderful time today, and I hope these stories contributed. Bye, everybody.